The all-knowing physician hath his finger on the pulse of mankind. He perceiveth the disease and prescribeth in his unerring wisdom the remedy. Every age hath its own problem and every soul its particular aspiration. The remedy the world needeth in its present day afflictions can never be the same as that which a subsequent age may require. Be anxiously concerned with the needs of the age ye live in and center your deliberations on its exigencies and requirements. Baha'u'llah. Thank you to everybody for the invitation to speak with you all. And thanks for opening with that, that beautiful song and writings. Um, looking at, at the pictures that accompanied the music, I think it, it speaks so much to what I found when I started to learn about the Baha'i community. Um, because even though I wasn't raised in a Baha'i family, um, that teaching of Baha'u'llah that the world is but one country and mankind its citizens was something that um, was close to what my family believed and, and was something that was reinforced for me growing up. Um, and when I encountered the Baha'i faith, I found that spirit of oneness was one of the most attractive qualities um, that was there. So uh, for those who don't know, the Baha'i faith is an independent world religion and revolves around this really revolutionary principle of oneness and unity. And I think it's something that um, can never be uh, uh, really underestimated how, how powerful um, this concept is when we talk about oneness being that connection point. And I think that Part of what I want to talk about today is a little bit about some reflections on, on that idea um, and how that principle of oneness has, has really carried me through my adulthood as I've learned about the Baha'i faith and, and tried to um, adhere to the principles as best as I could. Um, but I want to start by saying that as, as someone who moves in a lot of interfaith circles, uh, I'm a strong believer that we're really only responsible for representing our own faith journey and our own story um, and not the entirety of a tradition. So really whatever I share today is, is solely my perspective. And I want to um, uh, just call on uh, these words that I heard Imam Khalid Latif, uh, who was a chaplain at, at New York University, he would start his khutbahs many years ago. And I've, I've adopted this, this phrase for when I like to give talks that uh, anything I share that's helpful is due to the wisdom of those who came before me. And anything that I present incorrectly is due to my own lack of understanding. Uh, so with that said, I'll, I'll share a little bit about my story. So, um, I grew up in a Jewish household, as was said uh, earlier in the introduction. I learned to read Hebrew at a young age. Um, I went to Hebrew school during the week, and I went to synagogue every weekend. Our family had our Shabbat ritual every Friday night. I wouldn't say that we were an Orthodox family, certainly not at all, but, but um, that regular attendance and involvement with the community was, was very important. And when I was 13, I became a bar mitzvah, um, you know, which really cemented my identity as a youth uh, that was firmly Jewish. But um, there's a uh, one wrinkle, just one small wrinkle that in, although my father's entire side of the family was Jewish, my mother is actually from a Christian background. And to complicate things further, her mother was a Baha'i. Um, so how is that possible? So my grandmother actually learned about the Baha'i faith uh, as an adult at a dinner party in Greenwich, Connecticut. And being an open-minded and fairly progressive person when it came to spirituality, she was attracted to uh, this revol revolutionary message of the Baha'i faith. And my mom at the time, she was, I think, a teenager and she was not much of a joiner. And so she never really felt compelled to sign up herself, but she had and ha continues to have a, a great respect for the faith and its teachings. So here I was, I was a kid firmly rooted in my Jewish identity, but with a very complicated um, uh, mixed family dynamic. Um, but I, one thing I knew for sure was that we weren't Christian. We were definitely Jewish. 
And I had a big chip on my shoulder because of the history of the persecution of Jews by Christians. So even as recently as my, my father um, had, had been beat up on occasion as a schoolboy for being a Christ killer. He actually showed me once his school yearbook that still had the mark of a shoe print on it, on its inside cover from, from a time that some kids had jumped him on his way home after school. So this was something that was not an abstract. It was a very um, real uh, and, and somewhat present danger um, in my mind. Um, and to borrow a bit uh, from Holden Caulfield, uh, anything that had to do with Jesus in my mind was phony and, and Christians were phony. Um, that was my uh, perspective growing up as a, as a young man. Now, did it matter that my mom was nominally Christian? Um, not really, because she wasn't practicing. There was no church aspect to our, our life or, you know, to be more charitable as I think I was later as I understood things better. I felt like she was Christian in the sense that she was a good person, um, Christ-like in that in that way. That was the way that I've I've, I've seen my mom. Um, but the practice of religion of, of of Christianity was was totally colorless and tasteless, um, which for me just affirmed my prejudice. Really, that Jewish culture um, was was so much more valuable because it was rich in rituals and sights and smells. It was something tangible. I had a really strong relationship with Judaism. Um, but at the same time, this was a relationship uh, and an experience that was purely cultural. It was not really spiritual in the slightest. I didn't think about God at all growing up. Um, and that might sound strange to some of you. How can somebody have a, a religious identity or religious ob observance, especially to the extent that I had, um, but not really encounter God in that space? Um, and, and I think one, one uh, experience that are, illustrates this was that I remember after my sister's bat mitzvah, I was talking with one of my mother's cousins who seemed to be struggling to find some common touch point after really what was I'm sure an impenetrable synagogue service that lasted hours and it was almost entirely in Hebrew. Um, here was this Christian woman just trying to navigate this foreign space and she said, well, it's just nice to know that we're all here together worshiping God. And I thought, what are you talking about? I had, I had no, that concept never crossed my mind. Because for me, um, the, the experience really had nothing to do with God. It was about family. It was about heritage. It was about continuing traditions that were given to us and the importance of continuing those traditions um, because we had a responsibility to, again, because there was um, and has been almost for the entirety of history of the Jewish community an active force to wipe it out. So... Um, those were the things that motivated me. God and, and the stories of the prophets essentially were a type of Jewish mythology to me, that they were stories with lessons and, and sure they, had, they, they were valuable, um, but they didn't have any really historic or, or, or were any more verifiable than the stories of um, the, Olymp uh, the, the gods on Olympus, the Greek gods that I loved reading about, of Zeus and Hades and Persephone and Orpheus, all of these Greek myths that were fantastic stories, captivating stories um, that taught us about caution and humility and to be courageous, but, um, but weren't, weren't actually taken to be real, uh, literal stories. So, for example, I take the, the story of Jacob, Yaakov, which is my, my Hebrew namesake. And he's out in the wilderness, and he falls asleep with a rock as his pillow, and dreams that he wrestles an angel all night, and perseveres in the struggle, and the next morning he's given a new name, Israel. And it's a compelling story, and it's full of meaning if we want to dissect it in that way, but it, it's not really realistic. So I, I never grew up believing in a god in a in a being that was god in that in that way i believed in people i believed in that there were good people i believed that there were bad people and um and you know we were trying to make sense of our world really by doing the best that we could 
So that was a perspective that, that I had really as I entered adulthood, culturally grounded in my Jewish heritage and culture, but in a very material way and strongly suspicious of anything that was Christian, which, um, you know, although I was loath to admit it was really part of my family heritage as well. Um, and I think that if I hadn't encountered the Baha'i faith, I believe that that would be how I would continue to move through the world even today. But around the age of 19, um, I had a series of conversations with Baha'i family members, uh, my grandmother, as well as a cousin who was around my age and had also started taking ownership of his own religious identity uh, in that corner of, of the Baha'i uh, side of the family. And my grandmother gave me a few Baha'i books, which I took back uh, with me to college. And it was there that I began to learn to love a man, and his name was Abdul Baha. I read uh, a book that's called Paris Talks, which is a compilation of Abdul Baha's lectures that were um, given in that city in, in 1911, just after being released from, I, I believe it was around 70 years as a prisoner of the Ottoman Empire. And these talks are, um, as, as Baha'u'llah, the prophet of the Baha'i faith, describes his own text, The Hidden Words, the, the talks are clothed in the garment of brevity. Uh, many of the talks are only a few pages long, and one imagines Abdul Baha really only addressing his audience for about 15 minutes at a time, which I think is good advice for anybody who's giving a talk anyway. Um, and he writes in one of them, if religion becomes a cause of dislike, hatred, and division, it were better to be without it. And to withdraw from such a religion would be a truly religious act. Any religion which is not a cause of love and unity is no religion. All the holy prophets were as doctors to the soul. They came and gave prescriptions for the healing of mankind, and thus any remedy that causes disease does not come from the great and supreme physician. So I was really blown away by these, by these insights about um, religion and spirituality that I was reading. And, and I, I found that also around this time, I was able to put down the weight of prejudice that I was really carrying with me about Christianity. At the time I was involved with a, a lot of social justice organizing activities on campus and I was reading about revolutionaries and legendary organizers like Abby Hoffman and Bayard Rustin and Emma Goldman and Saul Linsky. And in a moment of inspiration um, that surprised me completely, I realized that Jesus Christ was really just a great community organizer. And I could accept him on those, on those terms. And um, I be, that really changed for me how uh, I perceived um, Jesus and his teachings. And it wasn't the end of my understanding, but at the time it was a huge leap forward for me. And it really helped me uh, essentially reconcile a part of myself. So um, reading about the life of Abdul Baha was similarly, in, similarly inspiring. And he had been a political prisoner. He was a humanitarian. Uh, he was an orator, a, a tremendous orator, and a tremendous strategist. And it seemed like an understatement, uh, maybe now, but, but at the time, he just struck me as someone who was superhuman. And I couldn't believe that more people didn't know about the life of this incredible man. So um, as I learned about the Baha'i Faith, I really had a, a strong connection with the person of uh, Abdul Baha. Um, but the prophet of the Baha'i faith, his father, Baha'u'llah, was a different story. And it was almost, it was almost like it was too much to handle. Um, even when sometime later I had resolved that I wanted to join the Baha'i community, um, although I believed in the teachings being divine in origin and, and actually re very logical in the way that they shape relationships um, between religions that were so often pitted against each other, this person of Baha'u'llah was still really out of reach for me. Um, it didn't dissuade me for some reason. I, 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 I had a, a certain sense of, of just going on feeling, 
really. Um, I didn't need hard proofs every step of the way. And later, when I eventually did get to know Baha'u'llah's life better and read about his life, um, it felt like I, I was being drawn closer to him, but it also affirmed the divine light that I could see in other messengers of God, Abraham and Moses, Jesus and Muhammad. And I actually liked that there was a mystery to it, that I didn't necessarily need to have all the answers, that the answers I had um, actually just led to more questions. And if anything, that felt a lot more natural to me to be in a, in a place of, of not necessarily knowing, um, but being comfortable with there being lots of questions. In fact, in the Baha'i calendar, there is a whole month that is named Masayo questions. Um, and I think these were, these were um, affirmations for me. So um, I appreciated that when I decided to declare myself at a, as a Baha'i, that at no point did the teachings or even the institutions demand that I give up my connection to where I had come from, who I was before. I was still Jewish. I am still Jewish. I'm proudly so. Um, but I was also something more by coming to the Baha'i faith. And I know that at my core, um, it's hard to shake uh, my upbringing. I'm still on some level the same Nebishi kid, very skeptical of faith and uh, looking for something more practical and tangible to grasp onto in order to make sense of things. But there are also times where I've been able to really give myself over to the magic of the universe and feel a profoundly spiritual connection uh, to something that's indescribable, but it, it so clearly has a connection to the divine, however we want to define that. Um, and I think an example of this is meditation. So the obligation to meditate was something that I will wholly admit uh, I shirked for at least a decade. Um, instead, I, I memorized the daily obligatory prayers and I performed them as I did the Amidah and the Shema, the Jewish obligatory prayers every day. Um, but meditation, I told myself, was something I wasn't good at. I didn't know how to do it. I didn't have the patience for it. And so there's the, the requirement to say the phrase Allah wa pa 95 times each day, it felt like a chore to me. I didn't really know how to approach it. And that went for a very long time, actually until um, just this past year, until February, 2020, when on the eve of the Baha'i fasting month, uh, which lasts for the, um, the first 19 days of March, um, and which was actually coincidentally, although we didn't know it yet, also just a few weeks before when the pandemic lockdown took hold, um, I was at an interfaith event at a Methodist church in DC, and I was learning about meditation with a Hindu monk. And for some reason, what this monk was saying connected to me in a different way. I already understood that um, anything, including Alawapa, could be adopted as a sort of mantra. I knew that um, breathing from the diaphragm was important. And I even understood on some level that I just needed to slow down. Um, but it was something in the way that this monk explained it, or maybe it was just, he had a, a very pleasant accent. Uh, he was from Mauritius. Um, either way, the pieces fit together. But I left that evening and I, I felt profoundly rejuvenated in a way that I hadn't felt before. And I felt armed with a really new intention to bring into this fasting period. So the following day, I woke up as we do before dawn um, to say prayers. And I was ready to give it a shot. So I brought out this set of prayer beads that a Muslim friend had given to me. Um, and incidentally, they have the 99 names of God inscribed on them. And I figured saying, Allah upon four extra times couldn't hurt because I was probably likely to mess it up at least a few times. But I experimented with, with breathing deeper and slower than I really ever had before. And I extended the chant of Allah upon, um, to last the length of each exhale. 
And I found that it took me, whereas before I would just say it in a matter of a couple of minutes, in this way, it took me 20 minutes. And I felt incredible. And I was, I was just completely hooked on the experience. So later in the week, I was feeling really encouraged by it and sort of high from the success um, of this new experience. And I tried to slow everything down so that the chant was really not much more than an unintelligible drone. And I could feel each syllable as it passed through me. And the experience of meditating and chanting in this way lasted for over an hour. And I can say that it was the purest connection that I'd felt with the divine in years, perhaps in the entire time that I'd been a Baha'i. Um, I, I don't live alone. I have a, a wife and a daughter. And at one point, um, we were in a, we were in our small apartment and, and I felt I, I needed to sort of apologize to my wife because the only way for me that I felt like I was going to do this right was to really release any inhibition of sounding too loud. Um, and I just had to go with whatever tone came out. Um, and, and I knew that she had her own practice and she probably didn't need to hear me doing my interpretation of Tuvan throat singing um, that early in the morning from the other room. But actually she said to me that she loved hearing it and, and that it changed the whole energy in the place. So, so that also encouraged me to, to keep going with it. And so this, this relationship with meditation has, it really feels like it's been a suit of armor for me during the pandemic. I felt protected against um, anxiety and, and worry on a level that I think I would have otherwise been really feeling in a devastating way. Um, it would have been really difficult on my emotional state, um, being isolated from friends and family and, and surrounded by uncertainty every day. Um, but I was, I was made stronger by this practice of meditation. Um, I, last summer, I went to the beach and early one morning, I sat in front of the water at dawn and I was feeling the, the rhythmic pulse, listening to the rhythmic pulse of the crashing waves. And I said the prayers and chanted a laopa really as loud as I wanted to out into the ocean. And I found that when my thoughts inevitably drifted to something that a friend had said to me recently or something that somebody had done with an experience that I had, I realized that rather than getting discouraged by the distraction, I could actually just accept the thought and invite them to sit with me at the beach. Just picture them sitting with me next to me there on the sand. And it may be obvious for those who I think are, are probably more mature in their meditation practice, but for me, it was really a revelation that I needed um, and, and was, was incredibly helpful for me to, to keep going. So I started meditating um, over each part of my body and, and letting the words sort of fill each limb with a, a sort of positive energy um, and allow that expanding energy to, um, to keep going through my body into the room that I was in, um, then eventually into every room of the house, um, extending to the other people that were in my family and each house that's in our neighborhood and each person that I'd seen during the previous day. And I would, I would think of them as I was saying um, these meditations. And I think that continued systematic practice of, of, of adopting that approach to it um, has really helped me feel centered and more connected to that spiritual side um, of, of, of this religious practice um, with so much more consistency than, than I've, I've ever felt before. Um, and of course, I, I still miss days and I get distracted and, and rush through it. Um, but I know that the experience is actually an aspirational one. And I'm buoyed by that, um, that it's important to make the effort and to feel a positive development little by little, knowing that it's not gonna be perfect every time or probably even most times, but Ultimately, the connection with something greater than ourselves is the thing that's, that's worth it. So 
if I can return then to this question that framed this presentation, can an agnostic Jew be a Baha'i? Um, I have to admit to myself that I don't know if there's a God, at least probably not the God that you believe in, because each of our concepts of God and our relationships are unique. So sometimes I feel the connection strongly and sometimes I don't. Um, but I think what's important is this. I think that none of us should feel that we're ever pressured to be Baha'i enough. You know, I, I grew up in a family where my father was Jewish and my mother wasn't. I went to synagogue and did that practice more than most of my Jewish friends. I knew the prayers in, um, in Hebrew by heart. And we observed Shabbat weekly in our own way. I felt like I was Jewish. And this was my, you know, uninterrupted, complete, I felt completely secure in my cultural and religious identity. But despite this, some might say, and, and did at the time, that I actually wasn't really Jewish simply because my mother wasn't Jewish. I remember that before I became a bar mitzvah and stood in front of our community to read from the Torah at Congregation Beth Israel in Scotch Plains, New Jersey, um, I was told that I needed to go to a mikvah, which is the ritual bath, to actually convert to officially become Jewish. And my sisters and I did this, um, but it was, it was really performative. It was ceremonial. I already knew that I was Jewish and I didn't need a ritual to prove it to myself. And really who cared um, if anybody else felt that I was Jewish enough for them. But in the Baha'i faith, we don't have a ritual. We don't have a test. We don't have a trial to prove our intellectual or spiritual conviction. We take people as they are flawed and imperfect and full of potential and eager to build a world better than the one we found it together. And sometimes, yeah, we're also riddled with doubt and uncertainty. But I believe that certitude is, is really a process. It's a gift that many of us, if we're honest, doesn't come naturally or is ironclad for the majority of people. I think if you're born with unwavering certitude, um, that there's an all-loving God, an all-loving creator guiding your steps at all time, and every move you make is one of faithful devotion, then, I mean, frankly, I'm in awe of your confidence, and you're probably a better person than I am, <laughs> for sure. Uh, my wife is one of these people. She sees God in everything and moves completely by intuition, and it's beautiful and incredibly annoying. Um, Faith does not come naturally for me. It's a learned practice. It's difficult and it's messy. It's a struggle. Uh, to borrow a phrase, it is jihad, the greater jihad. It's the struggle against the self. It's wrestling with angels and probably more often also with devils. Um, and when I joined the Baha'i faith, when I decided to join the Baha'i faith, it was really a feeling that this was something that I believed. One moment I hadn't recognized it, the next moment I did. It felt right, but it was very strange and unsettling. And when it came time to make that public declaration, um, I, I told uh, the friend whose home I was staying with, um, who's a prominent Baha'i in that community, and he said, okay. You know, it was as if I was telling him I was, I was running out to the store to get some milk. But then he paused and he said, now the hard work begins. And my understanding of that is that in the Baha'i faith, there's no idea of salvation being the destination. You don't declare your belief in Baha'u'llah as a messenger of God and then stay safely on base. The declaration requires us to prove our belief every day through our actions, through our conduct, and with our neighbors and our community and ultimately in the quiet, dark places of our own mind when no one else is watching. And I fail at proving this every single day. I don't live up to the principles I profess to 
to believe, I backbite and I get angry and I'm unkind. And worst of all, I think I fall into apathy or make excuses when I see someone who's in need and I don't really want to bother to help. Um, or I don't have the courage to make the necessary sacrifices. But I, I recognize also that I'm inspired to strive to do better. I have a goal. I know that whatever failings or obstacles I encounter are my own to work through. And the Baha'i teachings are very clear about what we have to do. We have to strive day by day that our actions may become beautiful prayers. Let your heart burn with loving kindness for all who may cross your path. Magnify not the faults of others, lest thine own faults appear great. These are the ideas that I really try to live my life by. And regardless of how close or far I feel from that unknowable essence that's the creator of the universe on that particular day. I think our, our life experience changes us, that God may be eternal, but as the science fiction writer Octavia Butler writes, God is change. The life energy that sustains us is the same one that forces us to evolve, that throws new situations and circumstances at us and says, here's your next test. How about this? How about illness? How about the death of a loved one? How about more wealth than you could ever thought possible? How about the smiling face of your child? How about a car cutting you off in traffic? How are you going to react to each of these things? What will you remember? What will you forget? What will you do better the next time? So I know for myself at this point that I'm not the same type of Baha'i that I was when I declared at age 19. I'm not the same as when I became a father 10 years later. Um, I'm not the same type of Baha'i that I was a year and a half ago before I, like everyone else, had to live through a global pandemic. I, I know that my story, my Baha'i story, is not anyone else's, and each of our struggles is, is different. And I remember when, when I had just declared, when I, was, when I was a college student in Boston, there was a prominent Baha'i who visited a group of us uh, who met regularly at, at BU. And he was much older and he looked very wise and he was very sharp in a, in a trim suit. And I was sitting at his feet in my shaggy hair and uh, a raggedy flannel. And he asked, you know, well, usually when I speak to college students, um, they wanna talk about uh, sex and drugs. So what do you all wanna talk about? And we all kind of shrugged and said, well, yeah, it's sex and drugs. And so we all laughed and, um, and this was, mind you, an internationally respected leader in the community. And he told us this, this, this story that when he was our age and had learned about the Baha'i faith, he wasn't just using drugs, he was selling them. And even after he had declared as a Baha'i, he continued to use and sell drugs. And one time he was in the middle of a deal in an alleyway or something, and the buyer said, so I hear you're a Baha'i, what's that all about? And that was the wake up call that he needed to really take a hard look at what was going on in his life and make some changes. And here he is now, he was this immensely respected figurehead uh, traveling the world to educate and encourage young people like me to grow in our spiritual journeys. So when I hear someone say, for example, that they doubt the existence of God, my answer isn't, well, you can't be a Baha'i. Uh, in order to be a Baha'i, you have to be sure. You have to be beyond any doubt. Baha'u'llah is the messenger of God for this day. I, I say instead, hey, man, you and me both. I mean, look around us. There's a lot of reasons for uncertainty and doubt. And on top of that, you want to throw in a 19th century nobleman who claims to be a messenger of God. I, you know, I mean, forget being sure about his teachings. I'm not sure I can pronounce his name properly. So it's Baha'u'llah makes a pretty cl crazy claim, I think, no matter where you're coming from. And so my point is that on the one hand, we have to proceed with non-judgment and on the other, encouragement. Um, there was a statement by the Universal House of Justice, the international governing body of the Baha'i community last year, 
and they wrote, at a time when the urgency of attaining higher levels of unity founded on the incontestable truth of humanity's oneness is becoming apparent to larger and larger numbers, society stands in need of clear voices that can articulate the spiritual principles that underlie such an aspiration. And this statement has really guided me during the past year, particularly when it comes to collaborating with people from different walks of life. Elsewhere in the letter, the house says, when society is in such difficulty and distress, the responsibility of the Baha'is is to make a constructive contribution to human affairs becomes more pronounced. It is a moment when distinct but interrelated lines of action converge upon a single point when the call to service rings aloud. The individual, the community, and the institutions of the faith, inseparable protagonists in the advancement of civilization, are in a position to demonstrate the distinctive features of the Baha'i way of life, characterized by increased maturity in the discharge of their responsibilities and in their relationship with each other. And this says to me that we as a community have a responsibility both to ourselves and to the outside world. And that the more people who know about the revolutionary teachings of the Baha'i faith, the more they can be indirectly or directly influenced and therefore have a positive influence on the world. Does someone need to live by all of the laws and teachings or understand them all completely for it to count? In my mind, frankly, no. If you want to ask me why the number nine has a special power in the Baha'i faith or why we repeat Allah upon 95 times instead of 96, or why we sit or stand at certain sections of the obligatory prayers, I have, I have absolutely no idea. These are questions that may be important, but they aren't the most important thing to me. Um, if you want to learn about the Baha'i faith, read Baha'u'llah's writings. If you want to see an example of a life of service, read about the life of Abdul Baha. If you want to know how the Baha'i community approaches social action, read the letters from the Universal House of Justice. I think at this point, I feel confident in being bold and forthright in sharing the Baha'i teachings, sharing about who Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha were, even with someone who's agnostic, even with someone who's atheist, if we're both maintaining a posture of learning and listening and coming to that conversation um, with good intentions to learn from one another. And if they're moved by the principles, um, then we can work together. If they feel that they want to learn more about the Baha'i faith and are stirred in their heart, like I was, then, I mean, honestly, I'll do what ever I can to share what I know, but otherwise I just try to get out of the way because it's a mysterious process and I'm not gonna let my own baggage be the thing that steers them in the wrong direction. Anything I have to say or that anyone else has to say about what is or isn't worthy enough to be a Baha'i and God forbid it, if we're writing it on Facebook, all of it is just noise. So with that said, I think that's probably a good place to close. And if anyone has any questions, um, I'm happy to muddy the waters even further. Thank you. Thanks so much for sharing your unique perspective. That was really interesting to hear about your background and how you came to the Baha'i faith. Um, yeah, if you have any questions now, you can put it in the chat and I'll read them. The first question is, how do Jewish people view Moses? What is his role, a divine manifestation of God or just a leader? Um, so thank you for that question. I think that's a, a common question. And as hopefully my, uh, my presentation shared, I think each Jewish person will probably have a different view on Moses. <laughs> so it's not necessarily helpful, but, um, but I, I think that's an honest answer. Um, I think some people will, will see Moses, again, as a historical figure, as a prophet, as a spiritual leader. Um, 
many others may not necessarily believe that Moses was a historical figure and and are are nice stories that you can sort of take lessons from but um but I think that the consistency is that Moses is you know one of the big names in the stories if if you've ever attended um a passover seder and you've gone through the story of of um of that that liberation story um you know this is moses's you know story this is a this is a story that um is of pivotal importance i think whether or not somebody is a religious jew because there are cultural implications um, to dissecting each of these narratives and understanding both what does it say in terms of how it informs our theology, because obviously Moses is who went up to Sinai and, and, and received the Ten Commandments, um, but, but also how do those actions um, affect our present day? You know, how does it, how do we speak truth to power um, in the face of rulers? You know, how do we lead a people to liberation? Um, how do we deal with our own um, anger and aggression? Because part of Moses' story is that he's a murderer. Um, the, they're complicated. When you get into the Bible, these are complicated stories. That's why there's the Talmudic tradition of, of debate and, and, um, and I think that probably more than anything informs, um, why Jewish culture is, is so much about that as well. I hope that's helpful. Yes. Thank you. The next question is, how do I explain Jesus to my Christian friends in the context of my faith as a new Baha'i? They all think I've abandoned Jesus when I joined the faith. <laughs> Well, I had the opposite problem. I had all my Jewish family think that I ran over and joined some Jesus cult. So, um, so that's we're we're on opposite sides of the fence, I guess, in a certain sense. Um, yeah, I mean, I think my my Jewish family thought that that um, again by association, you know, maybe if my if my mother's side of the family had come from a Muslim background or something then maybe they would have thought differently about it. But um, because they were, you know, culturally from a, a, a Christian background, they assumed that that Baha'i equals some type of Christian thing, at least non-Jewish, you know. Um, and I, I don't know what it's like for somebody who's grown up in a, in a strong Christian background. Um, I like I said, had a chip on my shoulder about Jesus. When I came to have a better understanding about the love of, of Jesus and um, was able to, to reconcile myself with, with his teachings, maybe not the community, but at least the teachings uh, and the person of Jesus, um, it, 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 felt, it felt like that that oneness again that oneness principle that extends to the the divine teachings that baha'u'llah talks about um it was it was clear where that path was you know so so to recognize baha'u'llah is to recognize jesus and to understand that the same light is between them right so so the uh, this this uh, metaphor that I I love of of um, you know the same light in many lamps that it's that same divine light in in different people in different forms through history some of whom we know the names of and some many of whom we probably don't know the names of because they're lost to history. Um, I don't know if that necessarily helps somebody who has a very has their sort of blinders on and, and it has like a monocular vision of, of, of how they come to Jesus. Um, but I think if there's at least an openness 
and a curiosity on behalf of the people to really look at the lessons, look at the teachings, you can um, simply show how the, how the teachings of Jesus are affirmed in the teachings of Baha'u'llah, at least in a way of like sort of, of sort of taking down maybe the negative energy a little bit, you know, because I think so much of it is, let's just calm down what we're talking about. I'm not lost. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not anti what you're about. It's we're we're actually, we have the same goals in mind. And if people can recognize that, then hopefully there can at least be a curiosity, even if they may think that you're you're wrong or foolish and 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 or misguided in what it is that you're going for. That's their challenge. You can't really do anything about that. But at least you can underscore that there's a common unity between um, the religious teachings. The next question. Um... Jack, thank you for your honest and deeply thoughtful presentation. How did your father and your Jewish community take your embracing the faith? Yeah, so uh, that was a hard one. Um, I, I think, it, you know, I, I was, um, I remember really clearly sitting down and writing a long email uh, sharing what it was that um, the decision that I'd made to join the Baha'i community, I was halfway across the world away from my family in Madagascar. That's a whole other story why I was there and everything. But, um, but I was not, it was not a face-to-face -face conversation. It was by email and there were a range of reactions. I mean, a lot of it was silence. Um, I had one cousin who, who said very uh, directly that she was upset that I would have chosen to leave. Um, I think for my father, it was, he took it very personally because so much of his um, life had, or it, it, with his, his experience of fatherhood was trying to, trying to pass on this legacy to his children. And in a certain sense, I guess he felt like I had abandoned it. Um, and that was, that was rough on our relationship for a while. Um, I think it's complicated further by the fact that my parents were divorced and that he had a negative relationship with, with that side of the family. Um, and so anything that was drawing me closer to that side of the family, you know, felt like moving away from him. Um, but I think at this point, you know, we can talk about things. Um, we were raising our daughter, um, as fully Jewish and fully Baha'i from my perspective. She knows prayers. She, we have a Shabbat ritual. She goes to Baha'i children's class. She participates in the Baha'i community. Those things are not um, contrary to one another. Um, and we participate in the family. And I think ultimately at the end of the day, that's, that's the most important thing. Um, and at our, our uh, wedding, my my wife and I invited our fathers to say prayers over us. And there's a prayer specifically for children that my father would say over us kids uh, every Shabbat, every Friday night. Um, and that was some that was that was a moment of peace in our week um, that was often occupied by a lot of strife because of our family dynamic. Um, and to be able to have a, a, a time of peace where we were just together for that Shabbat ritual was really meaningful me, for me growing up. And so I wanted to bring that into this, this wedding ceremony. And he accepted to do that. And, um, and, and I mean, it brought me to tears to, to feel my father's head on my, hand on my head um, saying this, this prayer that he probably hadn't said since I was uh, a much younger uh, kid. Um, so, you know, I think on some level there's, there's, even if not a full understanding, there's at least a making peace with it. So I'm encouraged by that. Um, the next question is, can you talk about your interfaith work? Oh, sure. Um, so my interfaith, uh, experience, I mean, obviously it comes from, from, um, being in a, in a mixed family and and so that's part of the reason why i'm motivated to do this 
but um, I worked for a time when I moved to the DC area for um, a, a Baha'i initiative that creates programming around um, um, Farsi language programming around the situation of the Baha'is in Iran. And so I, I was, while I was doing that work, the um, ad hoc leadership group of the Baha'is in Iran um, were all imprisoned. And there was a campaign, various campaigns over a decade to uh, help make the case for them to be released from prison and, and, and continually to have a better situation for the Baha'is in Iran, which is the largest religious minority in that country. Um, and the thing that started me out really on doing a more intentional interfaith work was, was reaching out to Muslims who I was getting to know for the first time being in a, a diverse place like the DC area um, and seeing if, if we could do some sort of a uh, programming together, uh, Baha'i, bring together Baha'is and Muslims, just in a, in a very small way, showing that there can be friendship that, that can exist there. And, um, and so we did some arts programs around poetry and, and music, and, and um, we had some conversations together that were hosted at the Baha'i Center and, and elsewhere. And, um, and, and that just, I think, really continued to, uh, to grow and snowball. And eventually I, I was um, invited to be a representative of the Baha'i community uh, on the board of an interfaith council in DC. Um, and so I did that for, for a number of years and just, it was just from strength to strength on that. I was totally inspired. It became really like a second job for me, um, a vocation in a certain sense. And so I've done different sort of media projects and dialogue projects um, over, the, over the past decade, working in this really wonderful um, and exciting community that we have here in the Washington DC area, which is so diverse. And um, and the most recent form that that's taken has been the last few years, I've been doing a, a dialogue radio show where I invite guests of different backgrounds to talk about um, their tradition, their perspective on their tradition, um, and what they, um, ways, ways in which they might work together and, and also ways, things that they might have hangups about working together. So that's the ish part of interfaith ish is trying to trying to navigate all the messy places where folks might not just want to be um, just nice and and pat about the whole experience, but really dig in a little bit and say, well, why? You know, why is it like this? So we have this dialogue show that's run out of a community radio station in in Tacoma Park, and. Um, and you can find it as a, as a podcast, anywhere you look for podcasts as Interfaith-ish. And uh, we always have a couple of guests on there from different backgrounds. They share a little bit about their story and then I invite them to ask each other questions as well. Um, and so that way I help facilitate there be, you know, sort of a relationship catalyst. And that's always been an exciting part of this whole experience for me doing Interfaith work is to help build those relationships so that we can build community together. Thank you. Um, next question is, it's been now almost a year that I've been engaged with online Baha'i communities. Unfortunately, the number of Baha'is are very few in Balochistan, Pakistan, where I live. I teach at a local university here. I personally have met only one Baha'i in a larger city. I would like to ask how should I as a teacher create more awareness about Baha'i teachings and traditions, at least to my students and colleagues? And did, did the, the writer say they're in Pakistan? Yeah. Well, that must be a very interesting experience doing that in Pakistan. Um, I've had a, a few friends, Baha'i friends that have lived in Pakistan at different times. I, I definitely know Muslim and Christian friends that um, have worked in Pakistan. So I know that there's a, um, a beautiful tradition of doing interfaith work there and some receptivity to it. Um, I, I don't know what I don't know what the what the cultural dynamic is though, particularly around the Baha'i faith. Um, 
So I think that probably the best thing to do if you're if you're interested in maybe navigating certain certain sensitive spaces or um, you know maybe maybe dangerous situations if if they're depending on the on the position of the faith in the in the broader community and with the institutions is to reach out to either the Baha'i institutions at the um, at the World Center level or um, you know even even a group for example like at the national level in the U.S. or maybe a, a, a closer well I don't know if, what the dynamic is with India and Pakistan but but um, the to ask for their advice about it because I'm sure that they would have uh, background and experience in this to be able to guide you in that. Thank you. The next question is, I'm a Baha'i from a Jewish atheist background with a devout Christian influence. How did you manage your outlook of not being trapped and worrying about being better? It's a struggle for me to latch onto good enough. Yeah, I mean, we just have to be patient with each other, right? It's just we're on a we're on a, a journey, and ultimately, the thing is that you know nobody can judge us except for God or the universe or however we want to conceive of that. So, um, if that's the voice in our own head, <laughs> you know, then then then. We just have to give ourselves that grace, you know, and, and be able to, to move through that. But um, we can feel a lot of outside pressures from other folks that make us feel like we're not good enough or we're not acting in the right way, what have you. But I think the thing that I've learned over, over my time is that at the end of the day, they all go home and 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 you have to live with yourself, you know, so whatever it is that you feel is going to keep your spirit afloat, um, whether that's study or community engagement or what have you, um, I think is, you ultimately have to really be, you know, be, be careful with your own heart, I guess would be the, the guidance that I have. But you can also, if you, if you want to reach out and talk specifically at more length about about that dynamic of being from that type of mixed heritage, I'm happy to to talk more one on one if that's if, if that's helpful. Is that Bonnie who was asking that question? I see a nodding person. Okay, great. Um, yeah, feel free feel free to if you, you can look it up. If you look up interfaith ish, you'll find my contact information interfaithish at gmail.com and and you can just email me there and I'm happy to to continue the conversation. Great. Do we have any other questions? I'm just going back through all of these, all of these uh, comments here. And is there a way to, I want to read them later um, because it's hard to track all of them at the same time. I'd love to get a copy of all these. Yeah, I'll send you the transcript afterwards. <laughs> that would be great. That would be great. How did you manage to embrace the Muslim and Islam aspect of Baha'i faith? Oh, I love this. Okay, great. So, so I didn't grow up with any Muslims in my immediate neighborhood. If there were any that went to my school or any of the, I don't know, youth soccer team or anything that I, whatever, I, I didn't know any. I probably didn't meet a Muslim until maybe I was in college, but even then they weren't practicing to my understanding I didn't basically engage with them um, as a Muslim um, the first time that I ever visited a mosque or talked to somebody about Islam was was immediately after college as a young adult and I think that very in a very different way from Christianity I had zero hang-ups about about Islam and everything that I read about it was beautiful. Everything I read about it was wonderful. Um, the teachings were gorgeous. The, the, the life of Muhammad was inspiring. The art that comes out of the Muslim world just blew my hair back. 
So all of these, for all of these reasons, it was very easy for me to um, click into uh, the, the divinity that's there present in, in the teachings of Islam. Um, as I said at the beginning of the presentation, um, this was at the time when podcasting was just starting to happen. And, and there was a wonderful series that Imam Khalid Latif um, did where it was these, these regular khutbas, these, these um, lectures at New York University. And I listened to dozens and dozens of them as a, as, um, you know, a 20, 21 year old or what have you, um, and learned so much about, about Islam. And, and I think that when I came to uh, Washington DC a few years later and started to meet more Muslims and, and then particularly even more as not just by happenstance because it's a, it's a diverse community around here, but um, specifically doing interfaith work, I also had the benefit of a broad range of diversity within the Muslim community. Um, so Muslims that were from uh, an Indian or Pakistani background, and Muslims that were from an Arab background, Muslims that were Persian, Muslims that were African-American, uh, Muslims that were Latino and white converts and all, you know, Sufi and, 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 and very culturally orthodox and, and, and people who had, who had, uh, who wore hijab and people who didn't and people who drank and people who didn't and skateboarded and didn't, you know, and like a danced and didn't, you know, like it was just, it was everything. So I think that that at this point I've got, I have so many different Muslim friends to, to call on when I have questions about things. And there's a real level of trust there that I think uh, has been built over the years with the friends that I have that I, I, um, I just, I think that, that that has been a wonderful beauty of things that I was able to enter into because I didn't have any preconceived notions of Islam going into it. And thankfully, I think because I was already, you know, I was suspect of the Islamophobia and everything that, that dominated so much of the news cycle and, and our politics um, during the last 20 years that um that that i i i didn't have any of that prejudice that i think many people who were afraid of muslims because the first time they were engaging with them was you know seeing what happened on 9 11 and and you know the tv show 24 or other action shows or something like that so i think the best thing to do is just make a lot of friends great thank you so thank you again for joining us. Um, and yeah, we hope to see everyone back here next week. Our speaker next week is Dr. Hushidar Motzlav, and his topic is the role of mothers in building a new world. Um, again, these are every Saturday at noon Eastern time. So please invite anyone who is not already here. And if you're not on our mailing list, I'll put the link to our contact form in the chat. Thank you everyone. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>